Lord, we just <clears throat> want to humbly acknowledge that what makes anything great is because of you. And our hope is, is that as we continue to share and to live in this great love that you have for us and herald this good news that greater things will be done, greater things will come because you will be even more in our workplaces, in our schools, in our churches, in our governments, on our streets, at our coffee shops, at our gas stations, at our libraries. And so we rest this morning understanding that it's less about us conjuring up our, our, our might to do something more. But it's abiding in the fact that you are and are continuing and still doing more because you love us. And you love Carrie, and you love our church, and you love us as individuals. And so we just rest in that today. I pray against any lies of the enemy that would try to come in even at right now and Maybe remind us of all the things that we've done to try to make us downcast and maybe that God doesn't love us as much or maybe he's not speaking because of what I've done last night. We want to just say that's a lie. You are speaking. You do love. While we were sinners, you died for us. And so what a relief that is this morning. We receive our, mer our mercies this morning. We live in them. And again, we just want to give you all honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Elise. It was really cool to hear Turner sing, wherever Turner's at. There you are. Awesome. Um, if, uh, if, you, if I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Joe. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, this is Joel and Allie in the front right here. Um, just kidding. Um, we, uh, we really just are excited that you're here. We, uh, we really just hope that we can be family to you. Um, we hope that we can love you um, and walk with you in this journey. And if you want to hear more about our story, we'd love to tell you about that. We're going to hope you stay right after. We're going to have a lunch together. It's called the Family Lunch. And that's not those who are just family. It's, we're all family. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we hope that you would stay, even if you didn't bring anything. We have enough food. I, um, and uh, Eddie, I think, is like cooked a bunch. Is gonna cook a bunch of ribs as well. I think I'm pretty excited about that. I got a picture last night, um, and we're really excited about this morning. So we're gonna get, we're gonna finish off our our uh, series, Be uh, Beauty of the Local Church. Um, it's been a three week series. We just wanted to get our our eyes looking forward on why the church is beautiful. Um, and this week, we want to answer that question. The church is beautiful because we, as the church, as individuals, and as a local church, have an everyday purpose. Um, and this is really important for us to understand because we're not just God's plan A, which we talked about the first week. Um, we're not just family, which we talked about last week, but we have this wonderful purpose in Christ to go and to love people and make disciples and be ambassadors of reconciliation and, and, and to be kind to people because it's the kindness of the Lord that leads them to repentance. And there's, there's this beautiful purpose that we have, not just on Sunday mornings. What a boring religion to believe in if you just had a one day uh, uh, kind of I get dressed up and go to church and raise my hand, and maybe cry and hear this guy speak and eat some uh, food together after. And we just go back to living our normal lives. That, that would be one a horrible religion, but also a horrible relationship. Imagine if you just kind of hung out with someone once a week and that was your only relationship or that was a big relationship in your life, we would say that's not, that's not a real one and it's not true in, in our faith. Our, we believe that we are in relationship with God and because we're in relationship with God, we are in relationship with each other and we have a wonderful purpose every single day of the week, Monday night, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, wherever you go and whatever you say and whatever you do, you are living out one or two purposes, either your own which is flesh sometimes and all the time, and it leads to yourself, or you live out Jesus' purpose for your life, which brings him honor and glory, which gives him praise. And when we live out his way, we grow and mature, not because we're trying better or because we're really trying to muster up something, because as we live out what he's called us to, there's this process of sanctification that he makes us less like ourselves and more like him, which is awesome. 
It's not a striving Christianity. It's an abiding Christianity. And as we abide, we live this wonderful purpose every day. If you have your Bibles, if you can turn with me to Ephesians 4, verse 17. This is where we'll be uh, in the beginning of our time together. Ephesians 4, 17 to 25. If you need a booklet, a pen, a Bible, they're right there on the side. If you have an app, go ahead and open that up. Ephesians 4, 17 through 25. Here we go, Ephesians 4, 17, 25. It says, now I say, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. A little bit of context, the Jews and the Gentiles, God's chosen people, the outsiders, the Gentiles, and he's explaining to them that we're not called to walk like the Gentiles, the pagans, the ones who walk in the world. And then he gives us kind of examples. He says, don't walk like them, who are in the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardness of heart, they have become callous and give themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity." We get this, this example of what he's telling them not to live like, and that not is like the world. He says, listen, as the church, as the body of Christ, you have this wonderful purpose, and it's not this. It's not to be futile in our minds or darkened in our understanding or alienated from the life of God or being ignorant um, because of our hearts are prideful and darkened. We we don't want to become callous or, or give ourselves to sensuality, to the greedy practice of all kind of impurity, and that all kind of impurity is what our desires of our hearts, what we want. Right? Before we were saved, we were slaves to that type of living. We, were, we weren't, weren't able to please God with our works or any kind of our, how we were living. We were slaves to this type of living. And so we see the writers, right? Paul's writing to them and he's saying, listen, don't be the, to the church, don't be a church that lives like the world. Right? He's just covering that base. Verse 21, or verse 20. I love, I love his writing. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him. It's like this funny little jab. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. We're going to see in verse 22 that he's going to give us the way that he wants us to live. Verse 22, he says, put off the old self, right? Don't live like the Gentiles. Put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. You need to know that before you were a Christian, your desires were deceitful. Even if you went to help feed the poor, and even if you gave 20 bucks to the homeless man, even if you helped the old lady cross the street, like, you still had deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, which is this new way to live, Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. As we live, we're called to pursue righteousness and holiness. Will we ever become fully righteous and fully holy? I don't think so. I think because we live in a, in a broken system, there's always going to be elements where we're not going to be holy and righteous. Not until Christ comes back and we're with him. But that doesn't mean that we don't stop pursuing holiness and righteousness. And when I say pursue holiness and righteousness, I'm not saying get a better routine in your Christian life. Pursue holiness and righteousness means to pursue Jesus. As we continue to pursue Jesus, we are then, in fact, pursuing holiness and righteousness. Amen? Verse 25, Therefore, have put away any falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one Another. What does it look like to, to live as a church who has a wonderful purpose? It's one who's not living in our deceitful desires, but it's putting on every single day. We talked about this last couple of weeks. You have to, to wear a shirt, you have to put it on. It just doesn't magically come on your body. You can pretend like it does and walk outside and everyone's going to see that you don't have a shirt on. We have to put on the, the Christ. We have to put on kindness and put on gentleness and put on joy and put on this life because by our natural state, we are unable to live like this. 
And so we put on his righteousness. We put on his holiness. And we don't walk around putting our fingers at people that they're not doing something. And we do this in the church and we do this outside the church. We gossip and make fun. But we put it on because without it, we are just um, uh, frail, dead people walking around. And so we put away falsehood, which easily can come in as we deconstruct our faith. No one ever talks about reconstructing. It's just deconstructing. We put away the falsehood. We put away the immaturity. We put away the kiddish things. Paul says, I walked like a child. I talked like a child. I lived like a child, but then I became an adult. All right? We have a phrase here that we say, we live with childlike faith, but we act like adults. (laughs) It's all great to see the kid run through through the meadows, but there's snakes there, and and they're not just being aware, not being wise. They're probably going to get bit. We want to run with knowing how we should live our lives in the world that we live in. Our values for our church are three simple things, and we say it every service at the end, and our elders still don't really know what it is. I'm just kidding. We always have a test on who's going to mess up. <laughs> our, our values are to love Jesus passionately, love others authentically, and love carry generously. That's what we felt that God has given us as values, as guide rails for us to live out our vision, vision which is to be a church beyond a Sunday morning, and to live out our mission, which is to make disciples who multiply gospel communities, which we're doing in Apex. So you have your vision. Vision never changes. We always want to be a church that lives, lives out beyond a Sunday morning. And we have, this, we have this hope as we multiply gospel communities, and we have these boundaries that help us. So as we make decisions in church, we give you a little input inside of what, how we make decisions. We look at our values. We say, what, in what we're doing as a church or an admission opportunity, is it showing that we love Jesus passionately? If it's not showing that we love Jesus, then we're not going to do those things. Because we don't want focus to be on us, we want it to be on Jesus. When we, when we think about what we're giving our money to or, or what, we'll, what we're doing, does it, does it show that we love others authentically? Does it really show, not just that we're giving money away, but that we really want to invest into people? When people come and ask for benevolence, we don't just want to give them money. We want to do life with them. We sit with them and ask them questions. How can we be, be a, a family to you? We, the 20 bucks, whatever, but let's, let's be family to you because we want to love you in an authentic way. As we think about 2023 and we think about what God's doing in Carrie, what does it look like for us to love Carrie generously? Opportunities to write to the teachers that we have going on today. A few moments go in the back and we're writing letters to the Wake County teachers. Encouraging them for all the stuff that they do. We're buying them donuts. We want to just bless them. Why? Because we want to love people in a generous way. We want to just talk about it on a Sunday morning. We want to be those things. And we get to, on the behalf of you and together, get to do that in carry. So we're going to talk about those for a moment. Number one is to love Jesus passionately. We see this in Matthew 22, 36. This is uh, 2238. This is referencing an Old Old Testament. A man comes to to Jesus' teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. We get this, 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 this from the horse's mouth, from God himself. What is the greatest thing that we should do? What's the, what's the, what, if, all the law and all the things that you call us to, all the prophets and, and people who have come and spoken, and the preachers, what is the greatest thing we should do? And we see Jesus says the greatest thing you can do is not show up to church on Sunday. It's not to, to pay your tithes or give to the Give Sunday or, or, or do an outreach or write a letter or go feed the homes. That's, that's secondary. What is the greatest thing, he says, is to love God. Love God with all our hearts. With all our souls and, and our minds. So what does it mean to love Jesus passionately? Well, we see here that it takes all of our hearts and our emotions, that everything that conjures up what it means to have to give him our hearts, all the things that we feel, we give them to God. God doesn't just want us to do things. He's not, it's not a, one of those relationships where you're always just the one reaching out and you're always just the one who's kind of doing the, the hard work. Jesus says, I want all of you. I don't want to just hear, I don't want to just be there when you're doing something. I want to hear how you feel. I want to walk with you in the, in the valley of your emotions. I want to walk with you when you're at your very low and your very highs. I want to be with you as you're mourning and, and you're rejoicing of the things that are in your life. I want, to, I want your heart. I want all of you. But it's not just our hearts, our souls. It's our desires. It's, it's our, our, our very being of who we are. 
He doesn't just want our emotions. He doesn't want to just listen to us and, and be there and care for us, but he wants our desires and, and, and everything of who we think we are, everything that makes us up, our souls. He wants us, but he also wants our mind. He wants the, the, the thoughts that we have and, 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 and the convictions that we, he, wants, he wants to walk with us. To live out this greatest commandment, we, we have to put everything on the table. He doesn't want just part of us, but he wants all of us. And that may be overwhelming for you this morning. That may be scary for you this morning that, that Christ wants all of you. And maybe you've been hurt in the past by natural being, people. And, and you're afraid that you're going to be hurt by God. But I can say that God's ways are higher than our ways. He, the way he loves is more pure than any. Even if you had the greatest parents or the worst parents, his love is so pure. And sometimes it's hard to put all of it on the table. But what we're seeing this morning is the greatest thing that we can do. If you are a striver this morning, the best thing you can do is, is to stop and love Jesus. If you feel like you're behind the group and behind the pack, the greatest thing you can do this morning is just love Jesus. Just start there this morning. If we love Jesus with all of us, and maybe you're like, well, he has my soul and my mind, but my heart I haven't given to him. Just start, just take a step towards it. Maybe he has your heart and your soul and, and you, you kind of like, your, I don't know if I, my convictions, I'm still trying to figure out who Jesus is. Just give him what you have this morning. And as you give it to him, I promise you that he'll be faithful to care for it like a precious jewel. And what will happen is over time, you will slowly start taking steps towards this amazing God. But it all starts with love. It all starts with us loving him because he first loved us. And as we love in this way, what happens is this process of sanctification that we talked about earlier is our thing turns into his thing. What we want becomes what he wants. It's, it, it's, it's so crazy how it happens because it's not like you wake up one day and you're like, I have no more desires. I want to just see what Jesus says. That's, I know that's like in every Christian, Pure Flix, I think is like the movies. Like, it's unrealistic. Even Christian radio is unrealistic. Me, me, my, me and my sister were laughing the other day, and I'm like, it's, it's, it's I feel like they always laugh before they go into the next song. It's like this, I don't know, maybe it's just me, cynical. But it's like, we're going into this song. <laughs> it's like, that, no one's real, no one laughs like that. We're like, what does it look for our desires to become his desires, our wants to become his wants? And when we live in that, and the sanctification happens, what happens is we live in his identity for us, and us, and our identity that we try to conjure up and make up which it falls, right? We, you know, so often we try to make ourselves something. We do our hair different. We, we dress different. We talk different. Um, I have a friend who's radically has changed from a follower of Christ to not a follower of Christ, and he curses every other word, and his whole lifestyle has changed. And the reality is, is he can try to make himself something, but eventually something will come and hit his legs out. Why? Because when we build a house on the sand, we always, we always crumble. But when I build my identity in what he has called me to be, even if someone comes and hits my legs, and even if life comes or someone passes away or there's something that happens, I'll still be able to stand, not by my own might, but by his power and his might. By my spirit, I'm able to stand because it's his identity, no longer my identity. It's when we live in this, we live out his values for us rather than our values. My value may be to be a good American, to do the right thing, to, you know, white picket fence, great job, retire when I'm 65, send my kids to college, all those good things, right? And there's nothing wrong with that um, in, in a sense. But when that becomes our main value system, that I'm, I am making something happen for me, the greatest thing I can do for my kids is leave them $100,000. That's not the greatest thing you can do for your kids. See, when our values become his values, the greatest thing that we can do for your kids is to teach the next generation of the goodness of God. And you can still leave them $100,000. But the first thing is to teach them, herald the good news. I love the Psalms where it says, we tell the next generation of his goodness. That's the greatest thing we can do as parents. And that's the greatest thing we can do as, with each other is to live out his values. His value says that we'll be known by our love not because we're great lovers, but because he's a great lover and he lives inside of us and gets manifested out of us. And so a value for us as believers is to live a life of love. And he was talking this through with, with a group of people in a hard time, in a hard context, where he says, if, if someone smacks you, turn the other cheek. Someone makes you walk a mile, walk two miles. Someone wants a shirt, give him your pants. Live in such a way 
that it profounds the world because of what Christ has done for you. I don't need my house. I don't need my clothes. I don't need my car. I don't need my status if God is for me. And so I'm going to live as a different value system. And the hope is, and the reality is, is that if we live in his value system, we should look different. We shouldn't look like the Gentiles. We shouldn't look like the world. We should be different. And the world should be saying, there's something different about this church. There's something different about those people. There's something different in the way they parent, in the way those kids go to school, in the way they love each other, the way they talk to each other. Man, there's something different about them. And that's where we see the presence of God is. The presence of God abides in a place where there's worshipful living out, this lifestyle of worship, because it's his values rather than ours. We see when we live in this way, we have a new song to sing. We have this new song to sing of not just salvation, but the, the beauty of what God's doing, doing in our hearts and, and, and all that he's done for us and what he will do for us. And every morning, this is like the song we get to sing. I get to go to work. I get to minister to people. I get to show them Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this job, and I get paid for it. There's this song that we sing. Well, thank you that um, if you're single this morning, thank you, Lord, that I'm single this morning. Thank you, Lord, that this is my song, that I can live a life of singleness because you have ordained me for this time to be that. And so I want to live this life in fullness. I don't need a partner. You are the only partner that I need. How, what a joy it is to live in the singleness that God's called me to. In every other facet of our life, we get to sing this new song. We have a new adoration in, in a life. We have this new adoration that we have in our life where we can, we can stop, praise, stop trying to praise people to get something in return, but we give adoration to God. Lord, thank you that you are in control of all things. Our new fixation is, is not on the new things that come out, the new cars and the houses and all the new models of everything, but our, our, our eyes are fixed on Jesus. What does it look like for you this morning to fix your eyes on Jesus? For Jesus, it was to fix his eyes on the Father, and he said that he went to the cross. His eyes fixed on Jesus, went to the cross with all joy. Doesn't mean it was, wasn't hard, doesn't mean it didn't hurt, doesn't mean it was overwhelming, but he went with joy. Joy in the midst of hardship is what it means to fix our eyes on Jesus. I may be going through hard times right now, maybe, maybe trying to figure out questions and answer questions or whatever may be going on, and as I fixate my eyes on Jesus, I get this view that is so much bigger than what I've been living in the weeds. Everything seems so tall when you try to figure it out yourself. I don't know if that's true for you, but it's true for me. When I try to make things happen, when I try to work it out, everything seems so small. But when I just fix my eyes on Jesus, I get this bigger picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what does it mean to love my spouse and my kids and my family. When I live up here, I get a, I get a better view and I live in a bigger view. I live differently. I live bigger than I would if I lived small because I'm so focused on all the details and I'm so um, irritated all the time. I'm so overwhelmed. Can I tell you, that's not the life that God's called you to live. As we love Jesus passionately, we we get to see this picture that is far bigger than what we often live in. Jesus becomes bigger and better than anything that's in front of us. It's important for us to understand that it has to start with Jesus first. It can't be like we love others and then we love Jesus or we love care. We do a bad, like it has to start with Jesus. There's this understanding of reconciliation and these Greek words, and the first Greek word talks about that we have to be reconciled to God first before we're reconciled to our brother. And oftentimes, we want to pass God and just try to work things out in the flesh because we're awkward when we see them, and it's really hard. But you can't work out the relationship here and then work this out. You have to start here. From the throne of, of God, I'm able to reconcile to my brother. I'm able to reconcile to my family. I'm able to, once I'm in, when I go to, go to Christ first and he, 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 he uh, um, refreshes me with this presence, I'm only at that point able to really love my wife the way that Christ calls me to love her. I'm able to, to live this life at my workplace when there's a lot of junk going on. I'm only able to really do that when I first have this worked out, right? And so loving Jesus is the primary thing. But we see the second thing is Matthew 22, 39. He's, he, he, he completes it. It says, this is the greatest commandment, which we just talked about. And the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. And I, and I love this because there's, there's such ownership. 
And, and it's, it's true in the first one as well. When we lo- it says you should love your God. There's ownership that we get that this is my God. This is my relationship with him. This is my king. This is my lover. This is my friend. This is my protector, my king. And it's true, just as much as Jesus is ours and we're his, we, this, this is our neighbors. This is our people. Love others. We want to love them because they're ours, because we are connected together, made in the image of Christ. We are connected. If you like it or not, we're all humans. And so we see here that as we love Jesus, the second is very much like it, just as important. You should love your neighbor as yourself. What we see here is loving others is directly tied to loving Jesus. We don't get the option to pick and choose who we love because we love God. Because we love God, it's, it's this automatic response that I must love others, that I get to love others. I get to love others who are mine. You know, we take ownership of our things. Your car, your clothes, your kids, your spouses. And what we see here, we should add in another element into that system. It's your neighbor. You should take ownership of your neighbor, physical neighbor, but also the people within the church. So how do we love our neighbors in an authentic way? What does that look like for us to to really love them even within the church? We'll talk about the outside the next point, but in the church, how do we love each other? Well, I want to propose the very same thing that we see in the the first section, is that we love our neighbor, our fellow brothers and sisters in this room with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our minds. We love each other, and we're vulnerable with each other, and we're honest with each other to share our dreams and our emotions and our hurts and our pains with each other. Why? Because we're each other's. You're mine. I'm yours. There's this relationship we have because we're the body of Christ. So I'm going to share my my heart with my brother knowing that he's going to care for me because we're each other's, because we're taking ownership of this amazing relationship they have with each other. Will people hurt you? Yes. People will hurt you. I think that the, amount, the percentage of people that hurt us, I would say 80% of it is just out of ignorance and out of just being immature. There is a realistic 20% where someone is out to get you. And I've, and I've been in that situation. <laughs> I'm part of the 20%. It's real. And even though I am a part of that 20%, I'm also part of the 80% that's saying that most people don't know what they're really doing. And we often say that hurt people hurt people, and it's very true of that 80%. People who are just hurt cannot stand to live alone. And so we want to we honor that this morning, that, that as you stepped out and given someone your emotions or your dreams or your heart and they backstabbed you or whatever words you want to use, realize that there's probably something deep going on inside of them. And if it's the 20% that are really coming after you and your family, I've learned in that season to pray the prayer of David. Lord, you have your revenge because it's not mine. It's not. And thank God for David's prayers, right? We're not like stabbing each other and killing each other like they were back then. Like he, I don't know if you guys are reading through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and CBR. It's like crazy what, what David prays and what he does, right? We're not, we're not living that. But there's still freedom for to say, Lord, this person has hurt me. There's something wicked. Would you deal with them? Shut the mouths of the lions. Confuse my enemy. Because that's what it feels like, right? We can pray those prayers. Give me permission. Not that I have any permission anyways, right? But like, I'm, I'm encouraging you. You can pray those prayers. It still has to be about Jesus. It, it can't be about them suffering. But you're saying, Jesus, confuse them so that you can live in freedom and also bring revelation, you know? Bring life, open their eyes to what they're doing. It takes all of, it takes all of our hearts to love each other. It takes all of who we are, our desires, our, our um what makes us us to, to give to each other. Now, I'm not talking about give our souls to each other, but the idea of, of, of giving our, our, our desires and, and kind of who we are to each other. Right? I was um, talking to someone not too long ago, and, um, sorry, it was on Facebook. That's right. And, um, and this lady was like, oh, you know, this person's like, I'm looking for a church, blah, blah, blah. And I, don't, you know, I only write like once a year or something. 
um, on Facebook, and I get like a million people saying how horrible I am. But I'll, I'll put a, I'll, I'll put like, oh, like the local church, it's unlikely becoming likely or something like that. I'll show it to Isaiah as accountability. And um, she, go, she writes back, and she's like, well, a church should be somewhere where you find the same fit and the same people that are like you and, and start going to this big thing. And I just, we and Isaiah were talking about it, and if, if that's what church was all about, me finding people who are just like me, that would be the worst church in the world, right? Imagine a bunch of Joes running around. It'd be like crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, thank God. Thank God. Um, it's not about trying to find the right fit. If it was about that, go like visit, go to a gym, go to a, you know, go find a club to be part of, go ride a motorcycle, something like that's more likely to, to be up your alley, but this is unlikely people. So when we say that we, we are each other's and we, and we can be, be who, are, who we are with each other, that means we accept each other where we're at. We love each other authentically because I accept you and you like board games and I don't and, and you like coffee, I like coffee and Louis doesn't and you know, he likes chai, which I mean, there we go, there it is, right? Um, we're still praying for him. Um, and so it's unlikely people coming together, we're able to, to give our emotions and our hearts, but also ourselves to others, because we know at the end of the day, we're going to be in heaven together forever. So let's start working out this relationship now. It's the beauty of Christ that covers. It's unlikely people coming together. It's not just that, but it's also um, uh, be able to give our minds to each other. What does that mean? Is that we're able to have real conversations. I know that... Uh, the church is always being labeled so badly, right? The church is horrible at really having hard conversations, or the church is really bad at, at you know, the church is always bad at everything. Yeah, it's Christ's bride, and he says she's amazing and beautiful. So when we say give our minds to each other, it means that we're able to have different convictions and able to, to still do life together and still love each other authentically, right? Now, this is where things get a little bit weird. There are like fundamental faiths, fundamental doctrines that we believe as Christians that it's going to be very difficult for us to be that intimate together and giving each other our minds and our bodies and all that stuff, right, to be friends and to love each other when we don't believe in the fundamentals, right? So don't we just push someone out? That's not what we're saying. It just means that it's not going to be as close, <laughs> right? Because the Bible talks about us to not be unequally yoked together, in a, like even in a relationship. That's not just like an intimate relationship. We always use that for, mar- for like dating. Well, I can't be with you because it's unequally yoked. That's, that's like a small part of what that actually is talking about. There is something about being family together in a church and being on the same page. Virgin birth, resurrection of Jesus, all saints, right? Like there's, like there's different things that we believe in that if we don't believe in those things, it makes it very difficult for us to do life together because our life is actually not going in the same direction. Unfortunately, because of that, we have different denominations and things have spread and the church looks so spread out that it does look connected. And can I say that, you know, we always say, I don't think that was God's intention. We don't really know what God's full intention was. I think that he, he's, he, I think he's big enough to, to bless those communities and to bless our community. I don't think he's like, well, because you guys are separated, therefore you guys aren't going to be blessed. I think he's a good father. He's going to bless us anyways, right? And so I think we just need to understand that there are some things that we're just not going to be on the same page about. It doesn't mean we stop loving each other, but does, it, it does mean that we're probably not going to be as intimate with each other. Well, that's why it's always hard when someone leaves a church. We talk about this often because a church is a place where people just decide to come and go, and it's not like we can stop people, right? But when someone says, I no longer believe, I don't believe in the theology that you believe in, and what is our response back? <laughs> this, is what, and this is what the Bible says. Well, this is your interpretation. This is mine. Okay, we'll find a church that you can be connected into that believes in that same doctrine and get on with your life, right? We want to just get on with things, but want to love each other in an authentic way, and we want to be able to have hard conversations. I would imagine if I gave a subject in this room, we would all have a different opinion on it, and that's okay. That's a good thing. It strengthens each other. It sharpens each other. But when that, when that thing becomes a dividing factor in our church, I would argue that it's not a, fun, like, not a real fundamental thing. If we, don't, if we all disagree that Jesus wasn't born of a virgin birth, then why are we even here? Right? So it's separating those things. I'm trying to just bring a little bit of a separation. We, we love each other authentically, but there would be some things that are just not going to work. Whether we're right or wrong about it, it's just the way I think things roll. Make sense? Loving others is messy. 
It's sacrificial. It's vulnerable. It's humbling. It can be really tough at times. And it's really time, time consuming. It's really time consuming to be part of a local church. Why? Because relationships just take time. And this is, our, we're based on relationships. Right? This, it, like, this is what we're all about. It's a family. Family just like, if you haven't seen your family in a long time, and you see them once in 20 years, it's not going to be like, oh, remember when you threw me up in the air when I was like five, and now I'm like 35, and you can't throw me up anymore? Right? It's like, that doesn't make sense. We need to build a relationship. It takes time. And so we want to take the time, and it's time-consuming and time and all those things, but it's what we're called to. It's worth it. It's worth it to live in community and to love each other authentically. Why? It's because it's how God created it to be. That's how he made it to be. That's how he designed it to be, that we wouldn't do life alone, but we would be in a family, a messy family, a family that doesn't make sense, a family that's always arguments. It's like we're being brought into like a Greek, a Greek family right? It's loud, and it's overwhelming, and it's all these things going on, but they're family, and that's what we are. Things are going to be messy. People are going to say the wrong things. They're not going to always make sense, but we still love each other in an authentic way. Why? Because his will and his way is better than our will and our way. His will, the way he designed it, when we live in harmony with each other, united to each other, there's a blessing. Psalms 133, when brothers dwell together in unity, there's a blessing there. I don't know about you, but I want the blessing. And the blessing comes not because we're just in the same room singing the same songs. The blessing comes when our hearts are united together. When I hear of a brother or sister sick, I take them something because we're united together. I want to love them like I love myself. If you're sick, you're going to give yourself medicine. If you're sick, you're going to give yourself soup, right? So when someone else is sick, what should we do? We should go out and be that to them, the hands and feet of Jesus to each other, Love Jesus, love others, and the last thing we see is love carry generously. We see in Jeremiah 29, want to turn with, there, turn with me real quick? Jeremiah 29, 4, five through, uh, 4 through 5, and verse 7. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 5, verse 7. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, God speaking to his people, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile. God sent his people into exile. It's good for us to know, right? Like, why are you sending me in a hard season? He sent a whole nation into exile. So he sent, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. He's going to send one, right, into exile, into hardship. I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to uh, Babylon. And this is what he tells them. Build houses. And live in them. Plant gardens. Eat their produce. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare you will find. Sorry. for um, Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. I love this portion of scripture. Jesus sends his people into exile. And we may feel, as followers of Jesus who are desiring to be in heaven with him, maybe right now, because of all the junk that happens in this world, we may feel like we're in exile. And as we live in exile, which we are from our God, being back with him in his presence, we get some advice on how to live in, in, in Cary, North Carolina, okay? Making it, make it context where we're at. He says, I have sent you into this area. Maybe you don't live in Cary, maybe you live in around the area, but you're in this church, which is planted in, in Cary, right? This is, this is for you too. Build houses and live. Plant gardens. Eat their produce. Seek the welfare of the city. What he's saying is, if you're going if, if to be placed here, by God has placed us here, us freeway church as a family, be involved in the city. Be involved in the town. Stop dreaming about what, what could be and live in the, the place that he's called you. Build houses, live in them. Doesn't, maybe you need to move here. I'm not telling you that. But where you're at is eat here. Go to restaurants here. Uh, if you live in Raleigh, take the extra five miles to go into Cary and put gas in the same gas station and build a relationship with the attendant. I promise you after six months, you will know their name, you'll know their family, and, and, and they will know that you love them which is the goal, right? 
What's an extra five miles to put gas? Eat their food. Seek the welfare of the city. Pray for our officials that are in Cary, North Carolina, in Wake County. Pray for our teachers. Pray for our policemen, our public works. Pray for the people who make decisions. I always drive down to Kildare, coming into town, um, and there's always the, the cross guard guy who's always there, and he's always smiling. And I always just as I drive by, I say, Lord, please just bless this guy. I don't know where he's at. Be with him. Be with his family. Just as you drive, you see the same people. You know, we, we think this is such a big city. It's not. You see the same people as you're on your routine, right? And he says, because I have sent you here. I've sent you into this place. And he says, pray to the Lord on its behalf because your welfare becomes their welfare and their welfare becomes your welfare. Jo- God put Joseph into slavery, into, uh, into the house of, 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 the, of the most important man in Egypt so that Egypt can be saved. It was because of Joseph that God saved Egypt through the famine. I don't know if you know that. It wasn't because Egypt was great. It was actually a, a, probably a really wicked place. Yeah, he put one man there, and because of that one man, the whole place, God gave him a dream, the whole country was saved because of this one man. What that tells me and what I see here and throughout Scripture is that that God has placed me in good places, in good boundary places he's placed me in. And I'm not to just, oh, I wish I lived somewhere else, or I wish I had this, I wish I had a car like the Tesla driving by, or I wish, like, we just just get fall into this trap. Maybe we don't say it out loud, but we think it in our hearts often. And he's like, I've brought you here to make an impact in Cary, North Carolina. Cary should be different the more that we, as individuals, as a church, pursue Jesus. It should look different. It should feel different. It should be different. And, And again, I love the ownership again, where I have placed you. This is your place. This is your exile. Exile is a bad place, right? Like separate it from homeland refugees of the kingdom of God. We're refugees. Our home's not here. It's in heaven. And as we're refugees and and exile in this place, we we take ownership of it. You know, when we we just, when I just took over um, Freeway Church, we changed our values to love, carry generously. And there was so much kickback in the beginning. Well, all we carry is about carry, and all, I don't live in carry, blah, 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 right? Most of the people aren't here that say that. But, so I can't say it out loud. But the heart was, was that this is our town. To the point, me and Isaiah were at um, uh, Lowe's the, uh, about a couple months ago, and we're buying fans for this building that we had to take down because they didn't like them. Um, we'll put them back up in the summer. But we're there. And these Apex police, and I say, hey, what are you guys doing in my town? Apex police. I'm like, isn't there an Apex home, <laughs> Hope Lowe's over there? And they're laughing so hard. But, but that's the heart that we want to have. Like, this is our town. Now we're in Apex, right? And so, better watch out. That's right. We, we want to take ownership of this place. What does it look like for our church to love our city, to love our town? We got to love and action and words to carry. We can't just speak in, pray, and laugh, and all here, but never do anything. We sit in our apartments all week. Even if you don't have, I'm not trying to even spend money. Just take a walk down, down, down the main street, the, the two blocks that we have, right? Just go up and down 50 times, right? Just, be, just, just say hi to people. Be aware when you go into coffee shops. Wear a freeway church hat so you, they know that we love them, or, or, or sweatshirt, we know that we care for them. Just, just be something to them. Want to love and action and words, want to evangelize. Jesus to carry. This is such a, a kind of a common sense, but it doesn't, I don't think it like comes up in, our, in the moment. We're called to evangelize. If, you know, um, there's this, this wise guy, um, and he, he said that um, if the punchline isn't, if the punchline of kind of what we always say isn't the gospel, we're compromising at some point. If, if all we talk about is the weather and, and sports, and we never actually bring in Jesus into the conversation at some point. We're actually compromising the whole situation. Jesus eventually needs to be brought into the situation. Hey, I'm a Christian. I go to this church. Can I pray for you? Um, I'm praying for your family. Is there anything that I could be doing for you? Is, can I, how can I bless you? We, we have to find ways to evangelize to people that are in carry, or why else are we here? 
It's not just to make money and to live our life. It's that we get to share Jesus' love to others. And this isn't just like the pastors or the office and everyone else. We all are meant to do that. I'm meant to do that. Um, Jim often will say as I walk out of the house, she says, don't forget to share Jesus with people. And it's a good reminder. My job and my opportunity and my calling, really, which is all our calling, is to evangelize, herald the good news to people. A loving church that loves our city is one who are ambassadors of reconciliation. I feel like in the last probably two months, Isaiah would testify to this, uh, um, and this isn't a bad thing, this is just, uh, this is what we're hearing. There's so much church hurt. So much church hurt. And it feels like the mantra of millennials, and I don't even know if Gen Z's are even old enough to have church hurt, but they'll probably throw it out there too, is like, we've been hurt by the church, Right? And again, 80%, I think it's an 80-20 rule, goes across the same way. 80% of the hurt that happens is just ignorance, maybe lack of maturity, and there's probably a real 20% we know of, of things that happen in the church that are just ungodly, wicked, perverted, all those things. And we want to acknowledge that. That does happen. And we pray for God's vengeance and, 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 and for God to judge those people because it's wrong. But not every situation is that. And yet that's what, we, that's what we, we hear often. I've heard this in many conversations in the last couple months. People saying, well, um, and the, the, the kind of typical thing is like, hey, you know, I'm not coming to Fruit anymore just because I've had church trauma and it's reminded me of my old church, right? You know why divorce is so, so hard? It's because when you do find someone to, as your spouse after the divorce, it's so hard to not feel like it's the same thing if they say it the same way. And so you may have been hurt by a church that's all about mission, and you come to a church that's all about mission, and you're like, oh, this is the same thing, I'm hurt. This is, this is bringing back triggers, right? But we see here in the word of God that we're called to be ambassadors of reconciliation, which means that we as a local church, as a family, are there to reconcile the hurt as we point them to Jesus so that they can establish and let their roots go low and, and grow. So if you're here this morning and you've been hurt by the church, I want to say I'm sorry. As a pastor, I know it probably doesn't mean the same thing, but I'm just sorry that you've been hurt. I understand it can be overwhelming. I understand that the very persons and people that you trust that have hurt you, it, it does something deep. I get it. I really do. But allow us or allow Christ work through us to come around you and reconcile you back to him. Because a wounded animal in the wild will be destroyed. You come in with church hurt and you're doing life alone, isolation is where you're going and that's where the enemy wins. And what we want to do is not come around and be the answer because we're not the answer. Jesus is the answer. We want to come around and point to the answer and have fun and drink coffee and play games and talk through hard conversations and work through that church. But church here, but we can't force that. We can't force it. I wish we could. I wish we can just force it and be like, let's do a weekend, everyone. You know, remember the office where they like do all the complaints in one day? Let's just get it done. <laughs> that is not going to happen. That would be crazy. But at some point, and I want you to hear me, my heart, maybe more than maybe how it's going to be said, is that at some point you've got to grow up. And what I mean by that is at some point you've got to let, stop letting the accuser continue to accuse. And, that just, and grow up means I, I'm not going to allow this to affect me anymore. I'm going to start taking steps towards that, whether it's therapy, counseling with the pastor, with the discipleship group leader, with the group of people, whatever it may be. We have a, um, a TK, you guys will see him in a couple weeks, he's coming back up, and um, he has like a crazy military background, um, and he tells like some stories, and we're always really excited about it, um, but we, back in California, we were playing paintball uh, in the middle of this like field that it was like where all the homeless people lived, literally 25, 30 homeless, we would play at 6 o'clock in the morning, play paintball, um, and these... Uh, and he has a crazy kind of war experience. And so he took a couple of us the first time because he wanted to be reconciled back into the idea of playing in a forest with paintball guns and not get like a flashback. 
And we had to do that a couple times um, just to make sure that he can play with everyone else, right? He doesn't turn like Rambo on us, right? And so what happens over time is that he was able to work through that this is just a game, that they were just paintballing, even though he always had a knife on him, which was always weird. Um, <laughs> and so what happened was over time, he was able to play with all of us. There's about 25 of us that played every Saturday. And it's the same with, with in church world. It's going to take you a while because you got to be able to come to church and then you got to get to know the church and then you get involved in the church and then you start trusting the church. It's a process. And we understand that. We're not like, if you don't, if you don't get your act together in a couple of months, you're out. That's, that's not our heart at all. But if it takes like two years, we're going to say, hey, we're going to help push that forward a little bit. Why? For the sake of yourself and for the sake of you not allowing your hurt to hurt other people, right? We want to still protect the sheep. And you, will, you are included into that. Last one. We want to be lights to carry. We want to be lights of the world. We hear this. We put it, put it on our you know, teacups and our tea towels. You know, be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Those are really cute. But we actually are meant to be lights in the world. This isn't just like a song we sing, or it's not just like a phrase we say as Christians, right? We want to be lights in a dark, it's a dark world, and God has called us to be reflectors of him. He is the ultimate light. And as we reflect Jesus, we then are lights in dark places. The places that you work, the friendships that you have, the golf course, the bowling alley. I don't know who goes bowling in here, but anybody? Sam, I knew it was for some of you guys. There we go. Eddie, I see your hand too. Amen. Um, but as we go into these dark places, we're called to be lights in these dark worlds. So how do we, what steps do we take to live this out every day? We're finishing with this. What steps do we take to live out these values that we have, that we see in Scripture? Very simple. <clears throat> Number one, is that we decide to die every day to our desires. We decide to die every day to our desires. What we see in Scripture is that God calls us. We wouldn't be able to hear the Father's voice unless he opens our ears to hear the Father's voice. So God, salvation belongs to God. That's what I believe. See what I see in Scripture? Salvation belongs to God. But it's our choice every day to live in that. To, 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 to live in the, the, the salvation that we have. You know, <clears throat> someone who, is, who has been in a prison camp for, for a long time and gets rescued has to change how he lives even though he's in freedom. It takes time to, to remember that you're not in enemy territory, that you're not encamped in, in, in slavery or to be in prison, but you have to, it takes time to, to live like that. And, and if you ever read a C.S. Lewis book, he talks about the man in the cave. And the, the, the man who's outside the cave is convincing the man to come out of the cave, but the man has been in the cave for so long that he's so fearful to come out. And he's missing this, this, this he just sees this, these pictures, but he's not sure what they are, and there's so much light. And so he'd rather live in the cave than be out where God created. And so often it's, it's true for us, I think. We're saved because God saves us, but we don't always live in that salvation, live in the freedom of the old self and living in the new self. To put on the right, it's a choice. We don't always do it, but it's still a choice. And even when you don't do it, you're deciding not to do it. I think we have to understand that as well. We, this, I think often as Christians, especially, I've grown up in the church my whole life, so I know like all the catchphrases, but it's like, you know, we're like, oh, um, you know, I, I didn't live in God's mercy today, but tomorrow's another day. No, you chose not to live in God's mercies. Well, it's like the bad stuff, we just think like, oh, it just happened, and I will choose the good stuff tomorrow. No, you chose, when you don't choose the bad, the good, you choose the bad. Make sense? So just let that, let that like, not set on you as, a, as like a, um, a, a, an, an unnecessary burden, but let it just be real to you. That tomorrow morning, if the first thing you do is pick up your Instagram and watch videos that don't point your man to Christ, and then you get up and then you just kind of rush out to work and listening to maybe some junk that's on the radio and you get to work and you're laughing with all the guys about how that chick's wearing a skirt and then you kind of like come home and you, you eat dinner, yell at your kids and go to bed, you decided to do that. We decide to die every day to our desires means that we learn to love new desires. We don't just love the things of God. 
maybe, maybe, maybe you got told that as a new believer. It's like your, your old desires have passed away and the new desires are here. Like, I don't have a desire to get up and read my word. <laughs> it's, just, it's not like sometimes it's there. Maybe when I messed up like the night before, maybe I got a fight with my wife and I'm like, I'm going to read God's word today, right? But like, it's not 100, I would say nine out of 10 times, the desire to read my word, the desire to think pure thoughts, the desire to, to, to do the things of God is not always there. It's just because I'm a sinful, broken person who's redeemed, but I'm still broken. Until Christ comes fully back for me, there's still some part of me, right? And it's, and it's so funny because it's like God's redeemed us, and we just percentages for the sake of analogy, but like if God 98% has redeemed us, and that 2% is not going to be done until we're back with Christ, I often went to the 2% more than 98%, right? I don't know about you, that's just me. And so I have to learn to love the new desires that he has in store for me. Just like you have to learn to eat well. No one's like, oh, I had to learn to eat McDonald's Big Mac. Gosh, it was so tough. So juicy. Bur-. You know, like no one ever says that. That'd be weird. Like, we, we do have to say, I had to learn to, to eat like this type of salad and, and it, got, it took a while, but now I just love to taste. Your taste buds actually change over time because you've learned to, to condition your body to, 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 to not die to the ugliness, but to eat healthy. And then you get this desire for it. The same with working out, same with with anything you do. It's like eventually, it's like you love the pain that comes with working out, right? Because it's this new desire. I have to hear it every single day with Isaiah when he comes to work, right? Gosh, people do CrossFit. It's like, oh, my shoulder hurts. And they're like, what happened? I do CrossFit. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I tease them all the time. Um, I'm loving the the desire that Isaiah has. I'm loving to love that desire, too. I'm walking out with you. (laughs) Um, to, die, to, die, to, die, to decide to die every day to our desires, it means that we actively have to starve our old desires, right? At, it's not just good enough to like learn the new ones; you have to starve the old ones. It means that you don't you don't you don't die to you don't die to the good ones and feast on the bad, right? A mentor always said, I say this often, but like we feed our faith and we starve our doubt. How do, you, how, do you, how do you live out this walk in Christ? You feed your faith. How do you feed your faith? With the word of God, prayer, time in his presence, people surrounded, the things that you watch, you listen to, you surround yourself, the things that feed your faith that point your eyes to Jesus. Eventually, that doubt, any doubt that you may have, it just, start, it just goes away. Again, it's the sanctification process. It's the same with this. How do we live in the new desires? We actively starve the old ones. We see the old ones for what they are. Right? Maybe you've had some, and this usually happens. We go like seven days reading our Bible, then we stop the eighth day and we wait for a month and we go back to it. But those seven days are amazing. Right? And, we, and you know, it's like, how do we continue that? I think that we have to count the cost every day, and we also have to look back and say, yesterday was better than a week ago, and I want to live in that. I want that feeling. I want, that, I, want to, I want to have that grace that I felt in that week. That's what keeps us moving forward. It's not like mustering up the faith and doing it better. It's just looking back and saying, I once was this, now I'm this. I wasn't able to run a mile, now I can. So I'm going to keep on running. I'm not going to give up. Because eventually what happens is that running and eating and all these things we're talking about just become who you are. Eventually, at some point, and we go through seasons of this, where you just are living out the things of God. The other things are not even a thought in your head. Why? Because we've been taking every thought captive. We've been dying to ourselves and all the good stuff. Number two, it's not just die, uh, decide to die every day in our desires. Two is to choose to live in Jesus' love for you. Jesus does love you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, the worst of crimes, the best of practices, Jesus loves you. And as we saturate ourselves in his presence, we live in Jesus' love for you. It means we take some time in the day, whether it's in the morning, lunch break, whatever you have time for, and you just sit and say, Lord, can I just experience your love right now? And what happens is after a minute, you want to read your text messages or Instagram, and you, you say, no, I'm not going to do that. You put it in the other room, and you sit in quiet. And you just keep sitting. And then what happens is, at that point, all the things you've ever done bad come in your head. That means that's the enemy. It means you're on the good step. 
It's like you're giving directions. Like once you hit, once you see that cow on the right, make a left. Once you start seeing all, hearing all those thoughts of what you are, that means you're in a good spot. You take those thoughts and say, give them to God, and just keep sitting. Once you get past the accusation, past the pain, past that, you you then embark on that scripture as a deer pants for the waters, and you drink from Christ. Saturation is give, just giving that time. It could be five minutes, it could be an hour, it could be three hours if you have enough time, but you just sit long enough and you just let God work through his process. Well, why would God allow me to see that pain? Just allow God to work through the process. Stop trying to figure it out, right? Just let God work it out and you saturate yourself. To choose to live in Jesus' love for you means that you accept being loved by Christ. And you're like, what does that even mean? Have you just said, I accept that Jesus loves me? It's so hard because we feel that sometimes we're unlovable, right? We tell that to ourselves in our mirror. We say stuff. But have you just said, actually, Jesus does love me? I accept it. I, I, have, you, have you even said, because of Christ, I am worth being loved? <laughs> That's not being self-righteous or being prideful. That's just acknowledging what is truth. You are worth it. Jesus loves you. Accept it. Don't fight it. It's awesome we want to fight for his love. He doesn't want to fight you. He already fought the enemy. He won. He just wants you to receive it and accept it. And I encourage you not to accept anything else but life-giving life. We often, we often just settle for a Netflix, binge-watching. I'm all for a good binge once in a while. Right, it's when that once in a while becomes every week. What do we do? We're settling. We're trying to feed the void, something that's lacking. Rest in God's presence. Hide yourself in Jesus' love. So many of us want to hide ourselves, and, and, and it's almost normal by our sinful nature. When things go wrong, we want to hide ourselves. Kids do it when they like go to the restroom and they like hide in the corner. Right? It's like awkward, and you're like, where's the little kid at? You know? <laughs> Why? Because there's so much shame, in our, a natural shame. Even babies feel shame. Yet, we can hide in Christ. It means that when things go wrong, and we've messed up, we said the wrong thing, thought the wrong thing, we can hide ourselves, and the good Father comes and shelters us. Can I say that hiding isn't a bad thing if it's in Jesus? Because when we come out of the hiding, we come out stronger in Christ. If you're going to hide, hide in Jesus. <clears throat> The last thing with this, choose to live in Jesus' love for you, is to live in the good boundaries. We're saying to live in Christ. means that we live in the boundaries that he set for us. Financially, socially, sexually, mentally, emotionally, live in the boundaries that he's placed over us. It's when we live outside of the boundaries that we become vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. If you want to live in Christ's love for you, you've got to live in the boundaries. That's the way it works out. You can't have the world and have Jesus. He says you got to pick and choose. You pick Jesus, live in his boundaries. Figure out what those boundaries are in Christ. Ask a mentor to help you. What does his boundaries mean for me? Live in the boundaries. Last thing, number three, how we take steps, is to live out Christ's love. So we live in Jesus' love for you, and we live out Christ's love. And this is what I want to say with this. What does that mean for you to live out Christ's love? It's, it's actually quite simple. It's to live out where you're at in your faith right now. So many of us live on two sides of the pendulum. One's like, I'm not good enough to be a witness for Jesus, or I'm a new Christian, whatever it may be. And then some of us on the other side, we're like, I did that. You know, uh, there's other people who can do that. Or, or like, I'm, I'm irrelevant to the next generation, whatever it may be. Live out where you're at in your faith. If, if we could put in percentage just for the sake of us to see it, is like if, if 100% is like running for Christ, whatever that looks like, and you're at 50%, live at the 50%. Just live it. Do it. Just stop waiting for the next conference or next mission conference. or something. Just live out your faith where you're at. If you're struggling this morning and you're, like, you're at like 20%, live in that 20% for Christ. Stop waiting for this like motivation on a Sunday morning to get you to go out. 
If you're at 10%, if you're not, just live where you're at. But there's some things with that. One is just be faithful. Just be faithful. If you're having a bad season right now and everything seems to be going wrong, live out your faith for Christ. But just be faithful. Number two is be consistent. Be faithful to, to, to living out his word, reading his word in, his, in prayer. Like Be faithful to the dailies that he, he, he has for us. But be consistent in your walk in faith. And the last thing is just be bold. You know, I love the story of um, the lady at the well. Multiple husbands. The one that she's with is not even her husband. Jesus calls that out. She was probably an outcast to the city. Um, she went to get water when no one else was there. I mean, there was a lot of intentionality, right? Jesus comes in connection with her, and her life changes forever. I love the story because she doesn't wait till she like went to the synagogue on a Saturday. She ran home and told all her friends, and the, the whole town came out to come to see Jesus. She didn't, she didn't wait. And I think too, much, too often we wait. But if we have true encounters with God, let's just live it, live it. And, and it's not like, well, I need to talk to three people today, and I need to build a hierarchy. Of, that's not what we're saying. Can you, just, can you just talk to one person about Jesus? Or can you just be joy to one person? Can you just be life to somebody? Can we just start there tomorrow morning? Or maybe tonight or today when you go home and put gas? Can you just say, hey, how's your day going? We just came from church. I just want to let you know that we, we talked about loving our area. I'm going to be praying for you. Can I get your name? Is there anything I can be praying for? Just that little connection. Most people are like, well, my wife is sick. My kid. Now we built in just a simple conversation. And this is what you say, hey, can, can we bring anything for your family? Can, I, can we bring some soup? Or can we, can we just, work, like, how can we help you guys? Oh, no, no, it's okay. Okay, I'll, I'll come back next week, and I'll, I'll see how your family's doing. Look how easy that was. Maybe the guy won't get saved for another five years. Maybe he'll never get saved. I don't know. That's on our, it's on our work to get someone saved. But we're building. And now I come back every week. Um, and, and talk to and talk to the guy. The gas station off Maynard, um, in Kildare. That's my gas station. I go at night as a night a night worker there. Um, and he's actually moving to another store, which I'm pretty bummed about. But I invited him out to Apex, and he was giving out Apex cards from the cashier, because he he's not he's not a Christian. He's actually a Muslim, and he was like, "This is so cool. You're so kind." And he was give, he gave, I gave him like 15 cards, and he's like, "I've been giving out to people your card for the church." Unsaved person witnessing for Jesus. He, he, he's not saved. I don't know if he ever will be, but it's just being faithful, all right? Just being faithful every single time. And can I tell you, if you're a family, if, you have, if your parents here this morning, and I'm, I'm not picking on, I'm not separating everybody else because of it, but if your parents this morning, your first mission field is your kids. Who cares if everyone else gets saved from who you witness to? Your kids is your first priority. We have a lot of kids in our church. Our, our kids is our first mission field. And if you're single here this morning, your family that's unsaved, make it your first mission field. Call up a family member, right? If they don't talk to you, then, you know, do what you got to do. But just, just remember as parents, that's our first mission field. Make sense? We don't need any more kids growing up in the church and leaving because... Mom and dad just live two different lives. We don't need that anymore. We have it had happen, right? <laughs> Millennials left the church. Why? Because they were tired of seeing the hypocrisy in the church, right? Let's be a church that is so pursuing Jesus that our kids just can't wait to, to be in our shoes. We can't wait. I love seeing all the little kids worshiping, running around. We don't say, you know, we don't quiet the kids down. We don't, kids are going to be kids, right? We want the next generation I want the worship leaders and preachers and evangelists and hospitality to continue this, not be for the legacy of Freeway. Who cares about Freeway? But for the legacy of the church, right? And it starts with us this morning saying, I'm going to love Jesus, love others. I'm going to love where I live. I'm going to be on missional, and that's why the, beautiful, the church is so beautiful. It's because you have a great king that came and sacrificed everything 
so that we can have freedom and we can walk in a new way. And not just for us, we're not selfish, we're not inward focused church, we're outward focusing. And as we live this new life out, the hope is somebody says, I want to be like that. Gosh, that is awesome. To be able to be in heaven one day, at least you can come up, to be able to be in heaven one day and see that. My hope is to see my buddy, who's the, who's the cash register, the Muslim, to see him saved in heaven with me worshiping, the true king. That, that would be the ultimate joy. It's not to like create such a nest egg that I'm able to like bless whatever. Again, not wrong in itself. But why are we here? Why is the church beautiful? It's because we have an everyday purpose. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. We thank you that you're faithful even when we're not. for salvation. Thank you for your love, your constant, faithful love, consistent love to us. Or let us live in that love. We want to experience that love tangibly this morning. We're just going to do a, a quick little thing before we finish. We're pretty much done here. But if you are not a follower of Jesus, and I don't know who that if there are any or not. If you're not a follower of Jesus, we'd love to introduce you to, G, to Christ. We'd love to walk with you out this faith as a community. Isaiah's in the back. You can just walk back there. He'll love to pray with you. But if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, I would love to pray for the activation of the Holy Spirit. Not that he's not with you, but this activation to happen that we see when he, when he blew on the disciples. There was this power to go out. It wasn't just a seal anymore. It wasn't just a, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was a power meant to go out. If you feel like I need that or I've lacked that, I'll just love you to stand with me. So I'd love you to stand. I'm just going to pray for you from the front. If that's you this morning, you're saying, I just need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. I need that reminder to go out this week and live it out. If that's you, just stand with me. Just take a few moments. We're just going to pray real quick. And if you're standing up, just put your hands in front of you like you're receiving a gift. Again, there's nothing more special. It just helps us to concentrate. We'll give a few more moments. A few more moments. If that's you, this morning, you're just like, I just need a fresh touch. I feel like I've been just settling with second best. Let's take a few moments. As we pray, if that's you, you're welcome to stand. We just pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and refresh your people? Would you come and refresh your people, restore the joy of our salvation that the enemy often steals? And would you remind us who you are, what you've done, and what you've called us to. And we pray that this purpose that we're lived out, that you would give us boldness, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control to live it out. Pray for a fresh fire of the Holy Spirit to come and to ignite inside of us. The devil, you are a liar. We are more than qualified to be ambassadors because of Jesus. We are, more, we are qualified to be ministers because of Jesus. And so we pray Jesus over us this morning. Jesus over us. Pray, Lord, that this week that we find moments to rest in your presence. Jesus. For the power of God, come and minister to our hearts and our souls and our minds this morning. Lord, forgive us for the times that we loved other things, that we thought about other things, that we gave ourselves to other things. And we pray, Jesus, Jesus' blood that has made us whole and clean, that's purified us as white as snow, would be the same Jesus that empowers us to love our neighbors. Give us a heart for Carrie. 
Give us a passion for Carrie. Give us a love for Carrie. Give us a contentment in Carrie. Give us opportunities to invest into our neighbors. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. We thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're all-knowing, the provider of all things, our defender when we're weak, our stronghold. In Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand this morning? We're going to commission.